place is absolutely huge. I don't think I've ever been anywhere quite so vast, such a vast industrial plant. I mean, they could be hiding any number of arms factories here and we would never be able to see them. People in Moldova often like to claim that Transnistria can't function as a, as a full state. It doesn't have the necessary industry or infrastructure. When you come here, you actually realize it clearly does have massive economy, massive number of factories. And in fact, some people here have suggested to us that it's Moldova that can't function as a state. And Transnistria will be the one that survives. During Soviet times, most of the heavy industry in Moldova was concentrated in Transnistria. When the territory proclaimed independence, it kept the biggest, most productive factories. But buyers abroad don't recognize Transnistria exists. And after the blockade imposed by Moldova, Factories are stockpiling goods and laying off workers. Actually, on this one, you can see the country of destination is supposed to be the United Kingdom. And they can't send it because of the blockade. But also, interestingly, it has made in Moldova. The action Moldova is taking against Transnistria is economic war. Transnistria has survived for 14 years without support from Moldova or the rest of the world. It has everything it needs to survive whether Moldova likes it or not. Another thing that people outside Transnistria have said to us is that this factory is one of several producing armaments, producing weapons. We haven't got time. We've got no time to produce weapons. Just steal. Transnistria is thought to be a major producer of arms, and guns from here have turned up in Chechnya and Africa. But nobody really knows what's going on. International organizations don't recognize Transnistria exists, so they're not able to visit and investigate. Transnistria shares a border with the Ukraine, and it's notoriously porous. There's all sorts of goods being smuggled across from cigarettes and alcohol through to quite serious weapons that are being produced in Transnistria away from the prying eyes of the international community. And to give you an idea of just how easy it is to smuggle in this region, where I'm standing now is in Transnistria and this road here takes you further into Transnistria. But if we cross over here to these fields and where I'm standing now, we're actually in the Ukraine. So we just crossed the border illegally, but there's no guards or border posts to stop us. There's not even a line indicating we're on a border, an international border between two countries. And this is what smugglers do. They'll come down here in a car or a van, and they can get into the Ukraine on well-worn tracks like this one in front of us here. And when they're in the Ukraine, they can get to the Black Sea port of Odessa. And from there, they can ship goods and weapons to the rest of the world. It's not just at the unofficial border crossings that goods are being smuggled across. They're also being smuggled across official crossings like the one down there. The Transnistrian and the Ukrainian Customs Authority, which is on the other side, are both notoriously corrupt. There's always goods being passed back and forth with the tacit agreement of some customs officials. And the Transnistrian Customs Authority is actually controlled by the president's son. The president's son is also alleged to be involved with a company called Sheriff, which Interpol has claimed is linked to arms trafficking. The firm has just built a multi-million pound football stadium where Moldova, who have no such stadiums, play their international games. Impressive ground. We're preparing for the World Cup game against Italy. When the president of FIFA, Sepp Blatter, saw this, he said... Wonderful, beautiful... <laughs> Apart from this stadium, Sheriff also owns supermarkets, petrol stations and a mobile phone network. Some people refer to Transnistria as the Republic of Sheriff. So it's called Sheriff because the two men who started it were both used to be Soviet police officers? Yes, and also because almost all of the people who work for the club are members of the police force or were officers in the Russian or Soviet army. I was a colonel in the Russian army before I resigned. 
Two days later, the Moldovans announced their upcoming match against Italy would in fact be played in Moldova's crumbling stadium rather than give Transnistria any publicity. Moldova lost 1-0. I just came around the front of the building because uh, we've been told there's a Mercedes showroom, of all things, uh, in the front of the stadium complex. Again, Mercedes cars being sold in a country where people are earning peanuts for wages. It's a little odd, but like everywhere in the former Soviet Union, some people earn a lot of money and most people earn next to nothing. How much does this cost? Uh, $16,000. So this is $60,000 to buy. So that's about 40,000 British pounds. Whew. Can we have it on credit? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Вот если в конце вашего фильма премьер-министр Великобритании господин Блэр if as a result of your film the British Prime Minister officially recognizes the existence of the Transnistrian Republic, then you'll receive this car as a gift. This car as a gift? Yeah. Right. Have I got Downing Street's number? I'm just gonna look for my telephone. <laughs> Let's get him on the phone. <laughs> Huge crowds came out to celebrate Transnistrian Independence Day. Although the population of Transnistria is only around 600,000, its forces match those of Moldova, leading to military stalemate between the two. Yeah. Yeah. Igor Smirnov, the Transnistrian president, was taking the salute. This has the most Soviet feel to anywhere I've ever been.